We take it from everyone. 237-2888. Mike Scott Plumbing. If water runs through it, we do it. Ocala's Information Station, 1370 WOCA. Ocala! I think I'm, I don't think I've ever started one of these segments with the word wow. We have a wow. We have a really big wow right now. We have on the phone Terry Lenzner, and uh, he's in New York. He's written a book called The Investigator, 50 Years of Uncovering the Truth, and this is his memoir. Just real quickly, I'm going to cheat and read from the, uh, the, the flap on the inside of the book. The Los Angeles Times once called Terry Lenzner one of the most powerful and dreaded private investigators in the world. In his 50-year career, he's worked with politicians, celebrities, governments, and corporations worldwide. I'm going to jump to the bottom. He uncovered cost overruns for the Alaska oil pipeline, helped identify the Unabomber, investigated the circumstances of Princess Diana's death, cleared Hugo Chavez's fall of false corruption charges, and he worked with President Clinton's defense team during the impeachment hearings, and it goes on and on and on, and this is his memoir. Wow, that's why I'm starting with the word wow. It's an honor, and uh, can't wait to hear what he's got to say, and of course the book will be able to tell you a lot more than we can squeeze into a 25-minute interview. Um, Good morning. Thank you for being on the air. It's an honor. Terry Lenzner. Good morning, sir. Uh, Larry, it's a pleasure and an honor to be on your program, so thank you for inviting me. And I didn't even mention, because, I mean, usually credentials will say, you know, he's been on Fox, he's been on NBC. If, if it's out there, he's been on it. Yeah. So, so, so th- thank you so for... what, he's been on it? <laughs> <laughs> you, you've been on, you've been on everything, uh, and you're the founder of uh, the Investigative Group International as well. So I'll throw that in as That's well. Correct. Well, thank you for being on the air with us this morning. Um, the uh, the book covers your your life and your memoirs. Um, was it something you dreaded doing? I mean, it's, it, I'm guessing you could have written twenty volumes of of this book. Well, um, I. For years, I've uh, been asked to, to write something, and I put it off and put it off and put it off because I frankly didn't think I had a history that was anybody would be worth uh, reading about. But um, I finally decided because of some of the lessons learned in the in some of the case studies, like in Watergate right. and in the racial conflicts uh, that we covered when I was in the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice, that it might be good to leave behind at least some of those experiences so we try not to make the same uh, what i would consider mistakes yeah either from the government or from personal experience were were you ever bribed Uh, I can't even remember ever being offered a bribe, but I wish I had. <laughs> so, so, so everything you did, and I guess the only reason to ask that kind of a question would be, if you had had never been bribed, which is what I thought would be the the case, then that would mean that everything you did was so secretive that nobody realized you were doing an investigation. That's true. That's okay. very true. But I don't think. Uh, um, I, that would have ruined my career, of course, and probably my reputation forever. Well, but, only if you accepted it. Right. right. <laughs> well, even, I'll tell you something. Interesting enough, <clears throat> when I was a prosecutor in the Southern District of New York, we were not allowed to even be seen talking to defense counsel so that the jury would not think that maybe we were being bribed by the defense counsel and therefore might uh, look askance at what we were doing and how we were representing the uh, United States government. So was that, was that, were you um, disenchanted when you first got into it and you started to see corruption? Um, did that disenchant, I don't know if that's the right word, but it, were you, did, did it change your mind about how our government works? Were you encouraged by what you saw, discouraged? I was, I was both, but I was primarily encouraged because I think the lessons that were uh, experienced in both the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which changed, I think, the the uh, uh, the psychology of the country entirely, uh, because we finally provided a vote for people who've been disenchanted, disenfranchised for over 100 years, and it changed, I think, the way 
uh, people looked at it, and it was a totally nonpartisan process, which is also a lesson that I don't see being adopted uh, these days. So that it was Republicans and Democrats together who pushed uh, the legislation through, and it was a huge achievement on the part of both parties. And the same thing, Larry, if I could say, goes for the uh, impeachment inquiry that came out of the Watergate investigation, which I was also, as you know, involved. Um, and that was really historic because I was working with Fred Thompson and Senator Baker and uh, the Republicans on the, on the committee, and we got along extremely well. And I was also, I mean, directly working for Senator Irvin and, uh, and Sam Dash, who was the uh, counsel for, this, for the Democrats on the committee. And we had, we were, we had communications. We, we disclosed things to each other. When we uncovered the tapes, because a Republican um, investigator had, had uncovered the existence of the tapes, we persuaded him to go and announce to the world that he, a Republican, had, had discovered that the existence of the taping system because we wanted it to, to be a real bipartisan Republican Democratic uh, uh, program. Mm, yeah, well, that would make sense. And and so you were keenly aware of trying to keep things uh, that did not look politically motivated. Exactly. Not politically motivated, not seeking any kind of political advantage, uh, and not trying to undermine the other party's uh, efforts, whatever they might be. If Do, nothing else, we would be trying to to coordinate the, their efforts. You know, if if you look at the intent of the uh, the people we refer to as the founding fathers, and you look at how we didn't stick to that intent by uh, by allowing slavery, and then um, by kind of maintaining um, this this huge segregation kind of policy after slavery was already abolished, but we kind of st- you know, there's a Randy Newman song, and uh, he talks about how we, we, we freed the slaves only to be caged again in, in, in different communities around the country, and, and I can't remember the name of the song, but, but I, I think the civil rights movement um, clearly undid the one thing that our founding fathers uh, professed they didn't want, but at the same time did nothing to stop it. For some reason, they didn't see that black people were people, apparently. Uh, when they said all, that's right, yeah. all men are created equal, apparently they just overlooked this whole, uh, one whole race of people. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and it took us a long time to finally undo it. And it, it, it's amazing how even in the 60s, that you would have thought that we were somewhat enlightened by the 1960s, which was already 100 years after the, uh, the Civil War, mm-hmm. that, that you wouldn't still need to be doing. But you, you, you played a huge role in that, so... I don't know. That, it's got to be one of your, your. I don't know if you have a trophy for it, but it's got to be part of your heart. That's one of your most proudest uh, invo- things you were involved in. Well, let me say uh, first of all that it, it is and was, <clears throat> and second of all, your summary of that historical series of events was one of the best I've ever heard, and I mean that. I really mean that, because you you phrased it and articulated it in a way that, frankly, I haven't ever been able to do. So. Uh, uh, yes, the answer is um, I didn't realize um, until I got down to uh, Mississippi, and I, the first case, as you know, was the Mississippi burning case, the cold-blooded murder of the uh, three civil rights workers, mm. <clears throat> and I called the chapter the murder of the innocents because I suddenly realized that that this was was a murder of innocent young men uh, who had just come into to Mississippi to exercise some rights protected under the Constitution, and they were destroyed, and their lives knocked out in about a half an hour of shots from Ku Klux, three Ku Klux Klan uh, people uh, on the road in, uh, in, uh, mm. to Meridian from uh, Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. In your role, at, in, in, your, uh, in, in the capacity of your role as an attorney and also as an investigator, did people come to you for different reasons? In the, you mean in the in the private practice? Right, exactly. Because yes. uh, be, because as as an attorney, a person might come to you and choose you for one reason, but as a private investigator, they might choose you for another reason. Well, that's also a great question, and the answer is that's a home run because exactly what happened. Once I left the uh, 
the government uh, and was available for private service. Uh, that's what exactly what happened. We had diverse requests uh, coming from uh, different corporations, different individuals, different states, sometimes different countries. We did a, a, a massive investigation for the Mexican government on uh, uh, people who had defaulted on loans in Mexican banks, Mexican citizens, and they were looking for assets to seize because they had uh, failed to uh, comply with their loan requirements. Uh, so we've had an incredibly diverse uh, practice, and it's been fascinating. It's been all over the world. And it's also provided a real education about things that are going on in Asia and in Eastern Europe, which I never would have known about had it not been for this. So, yeah, that's been a, it's been a diverse uh, practice, and that's what keeps it really interesting. Uh, the book is hugely interesting. Uh, if you could, uh, let's see, we'll ask you to just talk a few, about a few things you've written in the book. Dr. Frank Olson, can you talk about Dr. Olson? Yes. Um, Dr. Olson was a member of the, Dr. Olson was a member of the CIA. Um, I did not know him while he was uh, in the agency. Uh, I got to know Sid, Dr. Sid Gottlieb, uh, who was also in the agency, because uh, when um, the Senate started investigating mis, uh, improper activities by the CIA, um, Dr. Gottlieb was, was picked out and focused on because he had assignments which were extremely dangerous, and, uh, uh, and he had mixed feelings about them. He was a great guy. He's passed away now. Hmm. But um, when I asked him about why he had been engaged in some of the activities, he said, uh, they, I was recruited by the CIA when I was in graduate school. Um, I was a son of immigrants, and I thought I was doing a patriotic duty for the country by providing whatever the government asked me to provide. So uh, Dr. Olson uh, was a member of Sid Gottlieb's team, and they had been delegated to learn how to find out what, L what the effects of LSD might be on individuals because they had some uh, incidents where uh, U.S. government officials were in Moscow or in other parts of Eastern Europe and were found disoriented in different locations and, uh, and talking about things that were nonsense and when they started taking uh, samples uh, chemical samples of them they were discovering elements of LSD in their bloodstream uh, so uh, we the government of the United States started uh, researching mm -hmm. whether or not the Soviets were uh, perfecting LSD to uh, be used as a, uh, a stimulant to cause people captured by the uh, Russians in Eastern Europe um, to tell the truth. It was uh -huh. supposed to be a truth-telling uh, uh, drug. And, and so Dr. Olson was 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 in was uh, uh, in the middle of uh, those experiments, uh, and unfortunately, uh, was in the middle of an experiment in New York, and was, became disoriented by the LSD and plunged himself out of a. Um, a window in a in an apartment oh. building, or in a, I'm sorry, in a hotel. Oh, and it's a great tragedy. And make and make the connection. That was in '53, 1953. Yeah, that's exactly about right. Yeah. So, what was the connection between that and then 20 years later with Watergate? Well, it wasn't really. It didn't connect to Watergate so much as it did the investigation that the Senate was conducting about improper activities by the agency and other uh, and other uh. government agencies okay. um what what happened was when they started go back and reviewing it they were they provided this information to the surgeon general of the united states and the surgeon general came back and filed a report saying uh this is the this is our view of what happened and why the experiments were done so and and so this happened right. to be a, a time sequence larry when uh time had passed but, if, you know, nobody had looked at these issues in the past because everybody assumed the agency was a responsible group. Um, some of this thing, some of this, what, what they were doing was obviously a little bit over, more than a little bit over the top. And this caught up with them in the 60s and, and uh, 
early 70s. Wow. Uh, huh. I'm, I'm guessing you were at times the person they that other people didn't want to see. <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing you, ha- you I right, am I right about that? You had your share of people yeah, who would, fair. I mean, they, they could have easily given you some LSD and pushed you out of a window. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, actually, that's not funny, but... Um, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not, but... but it's <laughs> yeah, because you really weren't incognito. I mean, you were in the forefront of everything. I was wide and, open. And, and, right, exactly. Pe- people knew you. Were you ever afraid for your family or any kind of repercussions in that respect? At times, I've had the cases where I was concerned about the safety of my family and myself. Um, I can say more uh, incidents of that occurred in the South than uh, in, uh, in the upper Northwest, Northeast, I mean. Oh. Um, I did have some occasions when I was in the Southern District of New York organized crime unit for Robert Senate, I mean, Robert Morgenthau, the U.S. attorney, and I was doing organized crime investigations, and on a variety, number of times, I caught the same uh, car behind me or following me as I was walking oh, uh, wow. down some locations, and I started uh, uh, worrying about uh, whether or not I was being surveilled and whether there was some uh, uh, strategy here to either intimidate me or to harm me, because I was handling serious uh, uh, organized crime cases, including the indictment and conviction of uh, Salvatore Banana, the head of the uh, Banana family in New York. And and you didn't have any security for yourself, did you? No, none. Ay, ay, ay. Holy mackerel. Um, But the same thing occurred, Larry, in the South, because uh, after... um, after there was a shooting on the highway of Mrs. Leotza, uh coming back from um, from Montgomery to go back to driving some African American children to uh, back to Selma, um, she was shotgunned uh, on the same road that I was on, um, and I, I was uh, in front of her. Uh, I, didn't, I, I of course didn't know she was shotgunned until after I got back after I got to uh, got back to Selma. But um, after a while, I got to thinking, uh, you know, if you're in the wrong place at the wrong time in this particular area right. at uh, that time period, uh, you might have a problem. So, for example, I don't want to bore you with this, but at one point I was in a very dangerous county, Tallahatchie County, and the guy, and I checked into a motel, and the guy put me on. Uh, the, the hotel was pretty empty, but he put me on in a room that was on a, on a state highway. And I thought, I don't know why he put me in this room, but it's on a state highway. And if anybody wanted to take a shot at me uh, from the highway without getting caught, right. my window was right on it. Yeah. And so I uh, solved that by putting the mattress up against the window and sleeping on the floor. Oh, oh. oh wow. <laughs> Nothing happened, though, right, at that Time. Nothing happened. Thank God. When, uh, you, when you see a story like the story of Malala, Malala is the the young sixteen year old girl who was shot in the head a year ago, and now mm-hmm. she was uh, she's in America to talk about her book, um, and she was shot because she, uh, was she in Pakistan? Pakistan. I think so. And the Taliban shot her because she was you know trying to pursue her education, and mm-hmm. they didn't want girls, women, to have an education. When you see a story, yeah, I've read about that. Okay, so you see a story like that elsewhere, and you think. As bad as things are in this country, or as bad as things have been, at least we had some kind of a system in place, and not to say that it, everybody was safe in trying to correct the things that we had wrong, but, it, but at least there was a system in place to work with. It, it almost seems like some of these other countries that have some of these same issues, it's, it's going to be difficult because they don't have that system in place. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? I know. I think I know exactly what you mean because we, they don't have any rules or boundaries or any basic uh, moral uh, compass to, compl- to be yeah. uh, learned from. Yeah. And at least we have that. I mean, the Ku Klux Klan could go around randomly shooting African Americans uh, in the, uh, during the post Civil War era and even while I was down there. But it catches up with them, and we do have a system of justice which works. 
which I don't think exists in these other countries, Larry, that you're talking about. Right, and, and, I, and I guess that's what I'm getting at. Is, and I kind of veered from talking about the book for a second there. But, but I, I think when, when I hear about the, the fact that you put a, a mattress up against the window to, to protect yourself, mm -hmm. obviously anybody who had taken a shot at you would be violating the law. But at least there was a law to violate. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Right, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And there was also people that might prosecute you and put you in jail for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. So that's called a deterrent, right? So that's what we need more of, I think, in the country is, is a deterrent. Not, not being uh, as uh, revenge, but simply making the point that if you do cross that line in this country, you will be prosecuted, and it's not going to be fun. You know, and, an, and another thing, too, we have, we have, and I want to talk about the Unabomber, so I'm going to use this as a way to get to that, because you helped un identify him. But we have renegade people. We have, like, like if, you, if you were to say that the terrorists of 9-11 really didn't do what they did on behalf of a country, well, then they're the bad guys. That's, that's like the mafia, and you're going to round them up, and you're not going to blame the whole United States for their activity, Right. Right. Uh, and and right. and in the case of the Taliban or, or uh, al you know the Al Qaeda, whatever whoever we we blamed for the nine eleven things, we didn't really connect them to a country. We tried to, and apparently we we weren't right. Mm -hmm. But the Unabomber, we didn't know who he was, mm -hmm. and this was just one guy, one renegade guy in, in a in a shack somewhere, kind of like these two kids up in Boston. I mean, I don't know if you can connect the country to them. I know people are trying to do that, but yeah. So, I mean, so how did you help identify the Unabomber? Well, basically, the family of the Unabomber contacted one of my investigators in Chicago, which is where the family was, and they asked us for. They got suspicious because of the manifestos were being published finally, and they were looking at letters that uh, that uh, Kaczynski, uh, their their uh, brother or son, had written. And they was, became suspicious, and they asked for some assistance on a quiet level to see if we could ascertain whether or not there was any credence to believing that maybe there was a connection there. And obviously, um, our conclusion after we got the, the letters that they were talking about and other uh, examples of, uh, of uh, language that was being used in the manifesto that compared with the language in the letters to the family, mm. that we became in, uh, 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 alert that we may have uh, the Unabomber uh, identified, and we took it to the Federal Bureau of Investigation and gave it to them because that's their responsibility. And they moved in and, uh, on a timely basis, uh, arrested him and uh, got him off the street. But our concern was if we had waited too long, he may well have acted again before we had a chance to get the FBI to come in. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. The process worked pretty well there, but it was a family that uh, identified it, and uh, and I give them great uh, uh, praise because at the, at some points, Larry and Rob and I was concerned that they might decide, you know what, we better not give our push our brother into that kind of situation because we might be wrong, but they never hesitated. Uh -huh, uh -huh. You have extreme insight in your book into a lot of things uh, throughout the years. Uh, you also give insight into the selectivity of the different cases that you choose because you are inundated with requests. Well, um, you know, I have to say that uh, I like being inundated. <laughs> 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 because first of all, it makes me a little more confident that we're going to survive the ups and downs of the economy but second of all i love what i do to be candid and it's it's always fascinating me and and frankly it's all it's always been the study of human nature that's really what is interesting i learn more from these cases in terms of life and how people behave and how to uh, deal with people than of course the harvard law school and harvard undergraduate school didn't come close to providing and, and only living can it, there's a catch-22 in what you just said because that's a wonderful ability a wonderful talent um but it doesn't happen easy you've got to live in order to get that it's did, did that's the, exactly right the technology that was able to help us identify the the boston bombers in other words the cameras that were everywhere also was accompanied by people who had that same um background as you 
who knew human behavior because because just look at those pictures i wouldn't have been able to tell you who did it it it, it was right. it wasn't all technology that solved that one it was technology plus experience experience and then you put your finger on another great point because experience is mandatory for solving <clears throat> the kinds of crimes uh and any kind of mischief um the, the study of when we were doing a watergate investigation uh, we could we could see from the uh, body language and from hesitation and from dissembling in answers to questions that should have been easy to answer um, that that these particular individuals were fabricating uh, uh, alibis and reasons for why they were in certain places at certain times <clears throat> and that's carried over into our into all our investigations. The book is uh, in my hands. I want to give it away. It's 370 something pages. We didn't even scratch the surface of the things that Terry Lenzner is documenting in his memoir. It is called The Investigator 50 Years of Uncovering the Truth. I will give away the copy I have right now. If you call me, one person will get it. The number to call is 622 9622. The rest of us have to go buy it, and uh, myself among them. So, how do I do that? Do I go just go to uh, Amazon or, or my local bookstore? Uh, Amazon and your local bookstore should should be getting it. It just was it was just officially published on the eighth, so it should be coming into the bookstores. But Amazon is also the uh, one of the most easiest ways to, to get it too. And and do you have it? Is it available as an ebook? Probably is right. I guess they all are now. It is as an ebook. Yes, it's yeah. going to be. Uh, it is. They have done a recording mm. version of the book. Oh, an audio book oh, as well. Excellent. Uh, let me give this one away. Good morning. You've got the book. Who's this? Hey, uh, good morning. This is Anthony. Uh, great show this morning. Thank you, Anthony. Do you know where we are? Uh, no, I don't. Okay, we're in the Paddock Mall. Great. So the book will be waiting for you with your name. What's the first initial of your last name? B. As in boy. Okay. And and where we are in the paddock mall is outside the doors by the food court. So if I tell you the food court and you stay inside the doors, you'll never see us. you got to come outside the doors like you're going outside the mall. You'll see us right outside the food court, and that's where WOCA moved to about a month and a half ago. Very good. I'll come find you. Thank you very much. Um, a great show. A great guest. And uh, I look forward to reading the book. Thank you so much. It'll be waiting for you. Uh, Terry, thank you for being on air with us. It's an honor, and, and uh, there are so many things I'd, I'd love to ask you, and, uh, of course, 30 minutes goes really quickly. Uh, call me back. Th- call him back, Robin. Yeah, we're going to be uh, Well, you are definitely welcome. So, yeah, not, you know, that's not a bad idea. Uh, Terry, good luck with the book, and, uh, and definitely we will take you up on that offer to call back. And let me just say, uh, and I mean this sincerely, this is one of the <clears throat> most creative, interesting calls I've had. Um, in the last couple of weeks, so um, I'm very impressed. It was fun. It, they, you made you made this whole thing a great deal of fun. I mean, it's a serious subject right. and everything, but for me, um, it was challenging and interesting. Wow, wow, that's a, that's quite a, an honor to have it come from you. Well, I mean it. I mean it, Terry. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. You're definitely welcome back. <laughs> we'll take compliments all day long. <laughs> all right, we'll we'll take a little break. We'll be right back. We're listening to WOCA News Talk 1370, Ocala's source for what's happening in today's hottest up-to-date news and topics. Hi, I'm Yvette, and I'm here to tell you a few things about ABC.